and Kenneth MacDonald and welcome to this, the latest event in the, the Wigton Book Festival's Big Bang Week. Now in these uh, troubled times, a little perspective can help uh, and the perspective is available in the form of this. And this book is called uh, First Light, Switching on Stars at the Dawn of Time. It's by Dr Emma Chapman. Uh, the perspective it gives us is, is several billions of years worth of it, which makes our current travails in, in Europe um, seem small by comparison. Dr Chapman's Royal Society Research Fellow, um, Fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, has been associated with Imperial College London for, for some years, now lecturing at Nottingham University. And she is, as the name of the book might suggest, an expert, in fact a leading researcher in the search for the first stars in our universe. Emma received the 2018 Royal Society Dorothy Hodgkin Research Fellowship and uh, Science and Technology Facilities Council, STFC to us, Ernest Rutherford Fellowship. Um, it's an extremely readable book. It does take in all sorts of things like black body radiation that, that, that you'd uh, expect and perhaps were frightened to ask about. It also takes in Beanie Babies, Santa Claus, sharks, uh, Tutankhamun and pigeon droppings, um, uh, of which we may have time to um, uh, explore later on. But in fact, you may want to ask us some questions because we need your participation. As you're watching on YouTube, you can add comments and these comments will be magically uh, sent to me, um, and I will then ask them of Emma, uh, which will make me sound much smarter th than I really am. So, in in such way as you can in in the metaverse, if you could uh, if you could welcome uh, Dr. Emma Chapman. Hello, Emma. How are you? I'm really good, thank you. Not too bad at all. Been gardening good. this morning, so been getting out in the fresh air. It's nice. <laughs> I, I, I apologise for that. Um, you, we're talking about, well, the, one of the things that really concerns you, we're talking about you know, 14 billion years worth of, of universe. Um, and we seem to know pretty much what happened in the first three minutes. And then for about the first, what, 380,000 years. And then it all goes dark, literally, as, as you describe it, the dark ages. And is it dark because we don't know anything about it? But, or, but also, perhaps, because it actually was literally dark. Yeah, it's it's both. It's a fantastically descriptive term, actually. Um, unlike when it was used, you know, pre-medieval times, um, because it is, as you say, we know, a, you know, an astonishing amount about the beginning of our universe to say we weren't there. Um, and we can we can get that by looking at all of the all of the, the stuff around us and all of this radiation which I'm not going to go into. But yeah, the universe expands and then suddenly everything just goes very quiet the universe gets a bit bored it has a relax it expands very slowly everything cools down it's all very chilled out and if you were if you were stood there you know restaurant at the beginning of the universe you'd, you'd just see nothing it would be completely structureless in terms of of what you could see um and then suddenly you do have these first stars turning on blink 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 one by one this incredibly enigmatic picture but this is following a good 200 million 400 million years of complete darkness and i'm very vague there which tells you how little we know about this time except you want to be able to see this how how will you be able to to look at something which is dark Oh, super simple. We're just going to look back in time. No problem. Um, well, the the great thing is, is that even though when if we had been stood there looking around, we wouldn't have seen anything with our, with our eyes that are trained for optical light. Actually, there's still stuff there. Out of the Big Bang, you didn't get fully formed galaxies, fully formed planets and fully formed humans just popping out. What you got instead was the, the simplest of elements. So hydrogen, helium, you know, one proton, one electron. That's it. Just barely anything. Because that's all that could survive something so violent. And it is like, you know, you can you can try and build more complex things in that time. But everything's so energetic. Everything's pinging off each other like a pinball machine. Nothing can survive. But eventually that hydrogen, all of that hydrogen that, that forms, gosh, about three quarters of everything in our universe. It's a lot. It's just drifting around in clouds. But it is emitting light. Now, you might not be able to see it, but that light 
can travel huge distances, huge times, and we can tune into that light, which is now arriving to us at a radio wavelength. Now, I wish I'd put them some slides up now, but maybe I should get my whiteboard and start doing a whiteboard lecture right now. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not quite sure, but it's the way I always think about it is if anybody's ever watched QI about one time a season, somebody will say, did you know the light from the sun is eight minutes old? And everyone will nod along going, that's very interesting, that's very interesting. But actually that's got a very fundamental importance for us as astronomers because not only is it eight minutes old we are seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago so if somebody was doing a dance on the sun eight minutes ago we would see it and they could have stopped and walked off and it's the same with with the moon the moon oh gosh what's the light delay from the moon it's about one and a half seconds um that's very that's very small it mattered in the apollo 11 landings because if you wanted to press abort that mission control it took one and a half seconds for that to get to that those people and one and a half seconds for it to get back. Can you imagine the heart stopping three seconds? But you go further, the light from Mars is four minutes old. You go to Andromeda, our nearest galaxy, the light is 2.5 million years old. So we are seeing that light, seeing that, seeing Andromeda as it was two and a half million years ago. And so there's... all we need to do is tune into light that has travelled such vast distances from such vast distances away that it's been travelling for 13 billion years. And then we see, we see the first stars, we see the universe as it was 13 billion years ago. It's simple, really. We just have to... <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you have you have a big blow up picture of the, the the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which if anybody has not seen it, just um, Google it and, uh, as they say, have your mind blown because it is astonishing. It, it's the size. Well, they looked at a patch of sky the size of a five pence feet piece, but seventy five feet away, and they looked at it's about it from the size of the moon. Yeah, it's, yeah, you can you think of it as about uh, about half the size of the moon on the sky ish. Yeah. Yes, and and it was a it looked like a completely dark piece of sky, and yet it was full of, well, not quite everything, but just about. It's a shame I, could, I, I should have got it, because I've got a one metre by one metre canvas of that on my dining room wall downstairs that I stare at every single time when I'm eating my cornflakes. And you just get lost in it, because what it looks like is this, well, square of black. And if you just, just kind of glance at it, you're like, oh yeah, loads of stars, fine until you realise that every single blob of light is a galaxy and they're everywhere and they're different shapes, they're different colours, they're different sizes and they're different ages, actually. It's a flat image, but what it is is light from all these different times. And, oh, I mean, it's just astonishing. It's a beautiful, beautiful image. And because and yeah. light does take its time to get here, even though it does travel, funnily enough, the, the, the speed of light. That means that the further away you look, the further back in time you are looking. But still, from your point of view, if you want to see the very first stars, not long enough, not far enough away. Yeah, it's you have to just keep going, keep going. So Hubble, for example, looks back to about one billion years after the Big Bang, at a push, at a real push. Um, and... I mean, this light is is very faint by the time it gets to us. It's lost a lot of energy fighting against the expansion of the universe. You can imagine, you know, this this light is is continuously traveling, but it's like it's like being on a treadmill because the universe is expanding against it. So, you know, it's it's desperately, desperately trying. And that loses a lot of energy, which means it does shift from the optical wavelengths into much lower energy, longer wavelengths like radio, of which I've got a radio telescope as my necklace there, that's Jodrell Bank in Manchester. If anybody ever gets a chance to go there, please do, it's incredible. Um, and so instead of using Hubble, we start to use radio telescopes instead to look even further back. Um, and that light is a little bit stronger actually than the optical, um, and that, that's, that helps a lot. But yeah, we need new telescopes. We need different telescopes. Hubble just doesn't quite get there. JWC, if, you, if anybody watched that on Christmas, James Webb Space Telescope, 
there was a big launch and a rocket at almost exactly was it half past midday something like that um and they so they launched hubble's successor if you will um and that will look very far back but it still it still won't it, it won't reach the areas that we can just open the tomb door with radio telescopes we can really push back we can get right back into well gosh where are we going to be looking about 100 million years after the big bang probably right up to a billion years after so we're filling in this completely lost time um which is equivalent roughly to missing if we think of the universe's timeline akin to a your child's timeline for example or a child it would be like having a photo album and missing everything from the first day they were born to the first day they go to school. So that's the amount of information we're missing from our knowledge of the universe. That's that's a concerning amount of data <laughs> to be missing. Yes, and the, the stars you want to see, the, the stars that you think exist are what's known as population three you'd think it would give them the first star to be population one but let's let's not quibble about that population ones are the ones that we can mostly see up up there at the moment population three stars they lived fast and died young as, as it is put yeah absolutely so population three we can think of as a, just a different name for first stars it's actually i'll get on to that in a minute yeah um and and very early in the universe because you just have hydrogen for boring chemistry reasons that even i find boring um basically these first stars they 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 are very massive they're huge they're about a hundred times the mass of our sun maybe even up to a thousand times the mass of our sun i mean our sun's already pretty big <laughs> but when you get these gigantic stars what happens is that they they basically burn through all of their fuel super fast. So even though they've got more of it, they just guzzle it down and they, they end up exploding within about 1 million years from their births. Whereas our sun is around, it's, it's, it's around four and a half billion years into a nine billion year lifetime ish. Um, which again, I, I, I love an analogy, mate. It's the only way I think is, is it's, it's the same. Is these are different species of stars. It's comparing a human lifetime, that's our sun, to that of a fruit fly. So three days, three days compared to, let's say, I don't know, 85, 90 years um, for a human. It's this tiny. These are not just old stars. They're a completely different species. And for me, the fascinating thing is they're extinct, almost certainly, most of them. But really what you wanted to do then is, is we're like looking back in time to see dinosaurs, that, that, that sort of thing, extinct life forms, for, for, for want of a better argument. And it's not digging up their bones, which is what we can do locally. We can kind of, we can, we can see evidence that they existed around us. We can understand how they contributed to the universe they're incredibly important in terms of giving us the heavier elements because the universe just started with hydrogen that's great um but we have the opportunity here and we are taking this opportunity we have taken it is that we can look back and see them living and so it really is i mean i was obsessed with Egyptology as a kid so it really is it's not just visiting egypt now it's actually sitting back in your chair and watching them build the pyramids and, and that would answer all your questions. And it sounds science fiction, but it is, it's not. If you played with the speed of light, if you lived in a universe where the speed of light was really, 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 really much slower, then I could sit back and I could look over to Egypt and the light would have taken so long to get to me that I would be seeing it as it was 5,000 years ago. I could see them build the pyramids. And that's what we're doing just over such vast distances with vast speeds that we're looking about 13 billion years so it's interesting because you, you mentioned egypt and earlier on you talked about opening the tomb door which i take to be a uh, an analogy of uh, uh tutankhamun whom i mentioned at the, at the beginning you started off not actually wanting to be an astrophysicist but you're actually doing stellar archaeology 
yeah i um it's a really weird job to fall into but <laughs> it's where i ended up um yeah i was obsessed with with everything archaeological and historical as a as a kid and it was only when my my head was turned by how much bigger the mysteries were in in science and in astronomy and how much you know, I wasn't just going to be looking 5,000 years back, I was going to be looking several billion years back. And also, oh, by the way, there's this gigantic billion year mystery <laughs> of which we don't know when the first stars formed. We don't know particularly what they were like. We don't know how many there were. We don't know when the first black holes formed, the first galaxies. And so we have so much to play with and so much to understand. And that can affect our understanding of things today. I couldn't resist really <laughs> in terms of in terms of ending up exactly as you say doing some stellar archaeology and and yeah try, trying to figure out what on earth happened back then just piecing together the evidence of, of what we have today people must ask you yes but what is the point of knowing these things apart from the fact of course that we're human and we have to know we we, we need knowledge what, what is there a purpose to this does there have to be? It's, it's, I mean, this is it's a tricky question, right? I mean, there's so many. In, in terms of if we stay within astrophysics, there's absolutely a purpose in looking back. So, for example, the, um, the black holes at the centre of galaxies now, like the Milky Way, way too big. They're way bigger than they should be. Everyone's figured out how much they could possibly have eaten over time. They should not be this big. Except if something around the time of the first stars meant that we got very big black holes, which I'm going to later if you're interested. So there's there's yeah, astrophysically it's 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 interesting. If you go wider than that, let's go to physics. Let's talk about the current energy crisis for one moment. Okay, so <laughs> I, I'm on oil oil burning, heating and hot water here. My oil tank refill that we ordered three weeks ago has just gone up four hundred percent in terms of the cost so <laughs> that's a problem and it gets me thinking gosh where is fusion in terms of the free energy <laughs> that we can have on earth you know there's there's people trying to work out this this these these ways of, of getting energy from atoms and it's because it's already done in the sun they're trying to repeat what is what is happening in the stars and the first stars are a huge part of that because they are just formed of this pure hydrogen. They were the first thing, the first objects to, to display this fusion. So astrophysics, I always say, is kind of a laboratory to test what people might term useful physics. It's, it's a gigantic laboratory of, of processes that we actually can't physically repeat on Earth because they require too much gravity or too much heat or too much light or risk opening a black hole, <laughs> you know, all of these things. We can look up there and we can figure it out up there. And then, you know what, I'm not going to apologise for just finding it distracting because, I mean, actually looking up at the stars is not part of my job. I don't have to go outside and use a telescope and have a look at Orion or something like that. But I do that. And I go outside and I just get lost in it during lockdown, especially because it's free and because it is shared by everyone. And that can sound a bit corny, but I really do think it's true that you can walk outside and you could go, my God, things are bad right now. Oh. <laughs> and that's, I, I love that. I will, I will never stop loving that. It is what Carl Sagan said about it, connecting with the numinous, isn't it? Just going out there and realising this isn't abstract. This isn't just a set of equations or, or a, a huge amount of data. This is here, and it's amazing. Some people feel, though, crushed or oppressed by that. I mean, there's a close member of my family, no names, no pack drill, who cannot conceive of these immensities because they're just too immense and it makes them feel tiny. I, I take it you don't yeah. feel like that. Oh, no, no, I have. So I'm <laughs> plug my next book. I'm actually um, one of my next books is actually looking at how different people deal with with the scales and the times of the universe, because what I find when I give talks like this is people tend to be split into different camps 
and you have people like I had tended to be when I first started doing this at university, uh, really panic attacks at 3 a.m. in the night of how tiny I am and how small and how nothing matters <laughs> and everything like that. Um, and I think people can feel like that. And then I actually, you meet these people as well, that it guides their life in giving them confidence in thinking, you know what, my little problem right now on the scale of things, is it really a big deal? And it calms them. And I find that really interesting. And I think it depends on the time of day for me. <laughs> but what I do, what I do love is that I was going to say it never changes. It, of course, it does change. The planets roam around on the sky. The well, <laughs> somebody's going to write in now in green ink and be like, actually, they don't roam. They follow incredibly. But anyway, <laughs> you get eclipses, right? You get solar eclipses. You get all these events. But at the end of the day, literally, <laughs> you can look up. And the con Orion is still Orion. Orion still has his belt. Um, the Pleiades are still seven of them. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. I, I find it. Everybody has a favourite constellation, but it, it has to be Orion, doesn't it, really? He's, he's certainly mine. I know about three. People, people are always like, oh, so can you teach me the constellation? I'm like, no, because I look at stars way over there. I have no idea. I, I, I don't really care. They're random. So it's... Oh, there's an app for that nowadays. You just, you just pick up one of these things and point that it. And is... it is, it's it's wonderful. But it, I've, never, I've never felt crushed by it. I, I think that I'm possibly in the same camp as a lot of people, which is it's a privilege. Okay, we're only on, on this mortal coil for a very short space of time, but our eyes blink open and we see all of this. It's astonishing, isn't it? It is. That reminds me of Toe Fatch. It's, uh, it's paraphrasing it, but what was it? He said in one book is that we're all made of, we're all mud. And for 80 or so years, we get to be mud that can see and talk. And then we become mud again. So we might as well enjoy the part where we're not mud. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. It's, uh, he says it much better than that, of course. But Just yeah, I mean, if you if you think about how cosmically lucky we are in terms of the timeline, I mean, some people would say, you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation if things weren't precisely as that had been the the, the precise conditions that we have now. But you can turn that around and say, well, if we weren't at this point in our son's lifetime, our son's not trying to kill us right now, particularly. Now and then it has a solar flare and it tries to take out Twitter, but most people can handle that for 24 hours. Well, and, you know, we don't have asteroids trying to crash into us <laughs> or so many of them that it is a real threat. I mean, there's so many of them, but we have incredible telescopes watching out for them, including radio. So Judge or Bank, um, lots of these Arecibo, they are absolutely fundamental in, in tracking these kinds of things. Um, we're in very stable time, universally. Yes, universally speaking, yes. Universally. <laughs> we are not in a time where the universe is expanding so fast, so quickly, that it's tearing itself apart or that, you know, the space between the stars is so large that you just can't heat up planets. And there's so much that could have gone wrong. And yet here we are. It's, it's um, worth acknowledging that. And I'm starting to sound a bit a bit hippie here, but... <laughs> uh, just, just before I mention Joni Mitchell then, um, I, I, I should... Um, I should say that if anybody wants to join in with questions, please keep them coming. It's, uh, it's the comment section underneath your YouTube feed, and they're all welcome. I'll try to do your questions justice. Yes, Tony Mitchell, Woodstock, we are stardust. We are golden. That's the one other wonderful thing about these stars, the early stars, indeed the population two stars. They, made, they make the stuff, even the stars we have now, they make the stuff of which we are made. Yeah, absolutely. We're made of we're made of star stuff, as Carl Sagan <laughs> once very famously said. Um, yes, yeah, so the universe starts out with hydrogen, helium. You can't really make a human with that. You need carbon. You need oxygen to breathe. You, you know, I'm wearing jewelry that's made of silver and and all of these things. 
in the very early universe, you there's none of that. You have to make it. Um, you do that using this process of fusion. So hydrogen gets push, pushed so much that it turns into helium, and then you get lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. And it's only when these stars die that they throw out all of these elements into the wider universe. They pollute it. And then your second generation can start to form from that. And they die. They've done a little bit more of that. And then you get your third generation of which is our sun, really. Uh, metal rich, we call it, even though it's still, bear in mind, it's still about 98% hydrogen. So <laughs> um, it's, it's, and that that's actually why you mentioned that it's population three is the youngest. And that historically follows our understanding. So we thought that our that all stars were like our sun. And then suddenly we found out that there's some that are a little bit older and that didn't have as many heavy elements in it. So we called them uh, well, population two. And then suddenly we're like, well, hang on a minute. If the universe did begin when we started to realize that there was a big bang, people thought the universe had been like this forever, but bear in mind until, well, gosh, well into the 20s, 1920s, 1920s, not 2020s. I mean, I'm sure there's some people, but 1920s. <laughs> and yeah, and, and so and so then it became population three. And so it really is just a, as usual, us being earth centric and, and solar centric and, and thinking that we're very, very special until it really is shoved in our face that we're, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> or not, we, we, we live on a, 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 a decent enough little planet, two thirds yeah. of which is wet, around a around a, a pretty ordinary star at the unfashionable arm of, of, of a, a not very spectacular galaxy, and and yet we are privileged to to see this. I think that's that's one of the things that that comes across in this book. Another barefaced plug for it. Um, you can buy it from the festival website, incidentally. So. Former orderly queue. It's not too early to start buying for Christmas, you know. It, the the thing that, that struck me about it, just looking at it, there's, there's a great, um, here it is here, um, a periodic table, which nobody will be able to see, unfortunately. And I do apologize. Oh, yes, there we are. And it's it has hydrogen and helium. This is the, the astrophysicist's periodic table. Hydrogen, helium, and everything else is just marked metals. Metals. That's, that's even oxygen. Yeah, yeah. Hydrogen, helium, metals. I mean, we round up a huge amount, right? Huge distances, huge numbers. If you Google how many stars are in the Milky Way, which I have done a lot, it's, it's something like 100, no, 250 billion, plus or minus 150 billion. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I'm quoting Terry Pratchett again, but one, two, three, many lots, right? The troll counting system, and, and it's, it's the same. And we have to do huge times, 13 billion years. Oh, we just haven't got time to do the whole period when there's so little of it. Um, yeah. So you have to know, we we have, have to know, we have to look at things like, for, for example, dwarf galaxies. Um, which you have in a, in a chapter um, headed uh, galactic cannibalism. Uh, you, you better explain what, what all that's about and if it is, if we should be putting an X certificate on it. Um, yeah, well, this is this is um, a, a much nicer, believe it or not, name for something called hierarchical structure formation. It, all it is is the idea that big things came from small things stuck together. That's it. <laughs> and, and it's because there was... There was a debate. We take these things as granted, but there was a debate about whether galaxies merged to become bigger galaxies or whether galaxies broke up to become smaller galaxies. Um, and what it is, is that the universe starts out with few stars. These few stars start to crowd together and we get the first galaxies, small galaxies. And then these galaxies start to crowd together and collide. And then we get bigger galaxies. Our Milky Way, we think, I mean, it really does change all the time, but we're, it's not many. It's talking, you know, like a handful of galaxies have collided to make the Milky Way. And we can even see a ribbon of one of them that we've just utterly destroyed. Um, but yeah, if you still find these dwarf galaxies, of which there are many still around, these little tiny ones that have escaped this mechanism, they've escaped, they've not been absorbed by the Milky Way, for example, um, they are the oldest of galaxies. 
Um, and you can really look at that. You can see them as kind of pristine environments that haven't been really ruined. And so you can kind of try to look in them, see if you can find some super old stars. Yeah, and um, we've got about 60 of them orbiting the uh, the Milky Way at the minute, actually. And these would be what uh, what are described as population two stars, presumably, because uh, would they? Because they are that old. You can't get population three because they've blown themselves up. They they lived fast and died young, as as you were saying. So possibly we have some I don't know galactic fossils kicking about out out there. If only we could see them. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and there's a whole group of people called galactic archaeologists. <laughs> Name all of these amazing things. Um, yeah, and they, they look at the light from these dwarf galaxies and they look at what kind of stars are in there and what chemical processes have happened. And they see it as a way of looking at the fossils. And, and it will be mostly population two. We, bear in mind, we've got lots of population two in our, our Milky Way still around as well. Um, and there is this there is this hope among people that there might be some of these population three still hanging around. And I know that seems to go against everything I've said so far, and it does, that they all die within a million years. But <laughs> I said that most of these first stars were huge, right? Burnt through their fuel at God knows what rate, exploded very quickly. But as with anything, there's a distribution, right? It's like heights of your nine-year-old. You know, you're going to have an average height of 110 centimetres or something like that. But there's a distribution. You're going to have some nine-year-olds that are really tall, some that are very short. Same with the first stars. You're going to have most of them around 100 times the size of the sun. But you might get some that are actually the size of the sun. And they they fuse much more slowly you know they are going to live around nine billion years or, or whatever um and they could could still be around today and people think that the best place for looking at, at for finding those is within these teeny weeny little galaxies that are the forgotten fossils from from yeah from that era from the from the era of the first stars really one of the things that, that, that does strike me about, about, well, the universe and everything is that it all slavishly has to follow the laws, the laws of physics, but it does seem to also depend an awful lot on chance or, or, or luck. Um, that, that can't be the case, can it? Uh, it, it the, where the galaxies form, how, how stars form, it's, all, it's not random, but it's certainly not uniform. Yeah, I mean it's how how to how to think about that. I guess um, it's all governed. It was all <laughs> I don't want to say decided, um, <laughs> but it was all I guess uh, pinned down the instant the Big Bang happened because you you have a web. If you imagine like a, a big, big spider's web, just just really random spider's webs and not this kind of like lovely structure, but just, just this web everywhere. And that's kind of how the universe began. You have this web of, of hmm, what would you describe? It's actually a web of dark matter, which I don't really want to go into, but this this kind of gravitational trap, put it that way. And so you have this, all this hydrogen has to follow this web and it just sticks to it. It just, just gravitationally gets sucked in. And so the first stars do form and the first galaxies form along this predetermined web, if you will. I'm using this language very carefully because it's going into a faith thing and I don't want to go there. Um, but it's not something you can change. It's not something that a billion years later you can suddenly, you know, start forming stars wherever you want. It's it's really not like that. It's and that's what's really interesting, actually, because we can look around us now and we can we have observed this web. If you look at the pattern of galaxies across the sky, they, they follow a web. <laughs> they follow filaments and junctions. And learning about that can tell us about those first picoseconds 
of, of the Big Bang. And looking at where the galaxies are now, we can say, well, that's got to be where you have all this structural formation. I'm, I'm going off on one here because, I don't know, it sounds weird, but I don't find this part as interesting. <laughs> really? I'm going to be honest about that. But I never I, I, think about... I think one of the things about, about dark matter, and that there's this web that we that science thinks dark matter forms, and, and indeed there may be a halo of, of dark matter, for example, as you write in, in this book, and surrounding our own galaxy, which is, it, it, it's, like, it's like the framework on which everything else is built. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's mad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it also, of course, might not be there. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful idea, but, and it makes, it makes the equations work, but it might be wrong. I mean, is that a good be, thing or a bad thing for science? I mean, I think it's science. I think if if you are not asking a question, then you are not doing science. Um, in my in my opinion, I, I tell my students that because they you know they're always terrified that they're not doing a good enough job, imposter syndrome. And I always say, you know, you should turn up to work with one question, and you should leave that day with three more. That's how this works. And so, yes, we ask the question, why Why are the galaxies, why are the stars moving so much um, faster than they should be on the edges of a, of, a, of, a, of a spiral galaxy? It turns out the only way you can explain that is if you've got loads of stuff, loads of matter that's giving lots of gravitational force, of gravitational attraction, but we can't see any. So we'll just call it dark. <laughs> and this is where it comes from. You know, we've got dark matter. It's nothing exotic, really. What it is, is, wow, we need we need this matter to exist <laughs> to explain our observations. We've got loads of really good guesses what it could be. But until we, in, almost until we have some trapped in a laboratory to stare at, I think people are going to be questioning whether actually it's just, some people think it's dead stars that we can't see. Some people think it's just stars where the light's gone out, lots of them there, lots of them creating all of this mass. Maybe it's that. Or maybe it's this exotic new kind of matter that we've never observed before. New atom, something like that. So let's park dark matter, well, somewhere where we can't see it, which is just about anywhere in, in the universe, actually. And talk about what you want to see again, which are the population three stars, the earliest stars, the, the ones that burn biggest and brightest and, and shortest. You could, you're, you're working on, on, on at least a, a couple of really fascinating projects, one called LOFAR. Now, mm. um, LOFAR is, is aiming to gather so much data that you won't be able to handle it all, certainly not in real time. Absolutely. Um, we've been gathering data with LOFAR for 10 years now. What LOFAR is, is, I mean, this radio telescope is big dish. You, This is if people can think about, oh, yes, I know what a radio telescope is. They'll tend to think of a very big cereal bowl, basically. So you might have seen James Bond roll down Arecibo, the Puerto Rican radio telescope, you might have seen Contact, I think it's Jodie Foster, isn't it, Contact, where she's, she's with all of the, the radio telescopes in New Mexico. LOFAR's even low, more low-tech, more low tech, less techy. I'm not sure. Um, I guess more underwhelming than that. What, what LOFAR is, is what you used to have on your roof if you, if you had antennas on your roof trying to tune into TV aerials, for example. What that is, is about 1,300 of those parked all across Europe, all listening into the same thing, which is the radiation from the era of the first stars. And we collect all of that data up. So it's a, it's a radio telescope the size of Europe, huge amount of data. And you're right, we can't keep it all. Ideally, what we would do is we would keep it all and we go, right, where is this signal? Because the problem, is that we can't just tune in our telescope and say, right, OK, let's go to just just between radio two and radio four. That's where the first signals or the first stars will be. It doesn't work like that. We have to do a lot of work because 
of Radio 2 and Radio 4 <laughs> and because of every aeroplane that goes across, of every person that's having a mobile phone conversation within ridiculous number of miles, we get all of those radio telescopes on top. And so ideally what we would do is we would keep this data and we would look at it very carefully and we would clean all of that noise off until we've got the signal. We don't have that luxury. We have to look at the data or rather we have to write computer programs to get this data and go, uh, yeah, that looks good. No, yeah, no, 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 yeah. <laughs> Just chuck it away, chuck away a huge amount because our hard drives would explode. And I'm not joking. We work with we work with computer companies because we are the most data intensive area of science in the world that I know of anyway, and I'm pretty sure it is, in that we have to get these people to, to develop new ways of cooling hard drives. The the data the data speeds is, is larger than the global internet traffic. Oh my God, if you go on the Square Kilometre Array website, they're very proud of themselves. They've got like exciting journalistic fact, exciting, <laughs> which is like the fiber optic cables could wrap twice around the earth. I think of what we use, it's that kind of stuff doesn't help me because it's still like really big. And oh, SKA okay. is, is the other major project you're working in, the Square Kilometre Array, as, as you say. Mm -hmm. Sadly, it not pronounced SCA, which would have given me an excuse to haul out my Prince Buster's CDs, uh, which is a shame. But what, what is what will what is the Square Kilometre? A square kilometer array intending to bring to, to the party if you like that's going to take it further than low far this is the fun one that i'm helping to build now it's going to be in the western australian desert um and what that is is not 1300 of these um of very simple radio antennas what this is is 130,000 of them in the first rollout and in the second rollout hopefully up to a million and what that means is that we can we can hear much better. We can get a lot fainter light out from all of that noise on top that I spoke about. And what that means is that we don't just we can image that time, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. With LOFAR, what we can do is we can find the light of the first stars and we can say, aha, this is when the first stars switched on. This is when this many first stars switched on. And we can kind of get a rough, a rough idea of a timeline. So it's gosh, I'm gonna to have to think of an analogy for that at another point. <laughs> but what the square kilometer array does is it it does that for whole swathes of the sky. So much larger than the the, the moon on the sky, you know, it's it's much larger than that. And what we can do is we can build up images of of the hydrogen of the era of the first stars over a billion years. So we can tune our telescope and watch it growing up. And so we'll, we'll have a video, we'll have a home movie of, of our universe growing up. And that's what the Square Kilometre Array can do. And that, uh, when was that greenlit? July last year. So construction starting now. It's very exciting because we've been waiting a long time for that. And when, when are you you hoping, I'm mindful of the fact that every time I ask when, well, for a long time, when you asked them, uh, when are you going to discover gravitational waves, people would say, oh, yeah, another couple of years, another couple of years, or in the case of nuclear fusion on, on Earth, uh, another 20 years. It's always another 20 years away. But putting that to one side, when do you hope to say, right, that's it, we see the first stars? I think we're already there. It just doesn't get credit. There was one discovery in 2018 which it was very simple. Very, it, it, I still find it intriguing because instead of 130,000 antennas, they had one. And what this very quiet team of about 10 people <laughs> did was they took the temperature of the light coming towards them, the hydrogen that had existed 13 billion years ago, and they watched for when it started to get warmer. And they pin down the facts that, oh, look, when you look at all of that time, all of the observations from that time, it's starting to get warmer about 200 million years after the Big Bang. What could be warming stuff up around then? It can only be stars. And so we have that first data point, I think, that we have a birth certificate for the first stars about 200 million years after the Big Bang. So I, I really think that 
we have the floodgates are opening right this moment right this year and we're now at that incredible moment of science where we're not we're not waiting for the first gravitational wave as it were that was that was brilliant right that's happening every day now it doesn't get in the news <laughs> you know they're getting them all the time and and i think it is the same for the first stars i think in about oh i reckon put my money on it two years ish we will have that front page of the of the newspapers look we've managed to actually pinpoint and, and do this i think in about probably 10 years we'll have this this home movie um it is going to happen that's that's the brilliant thing is is um the floodgates have opened we've proved we can do it now is this this is the period of the university's development where um which has it sounds really exciting but has a really boring name the epoch of reionization which does sound mm -hmm. like something that was invented by the british civil service so uh, you, you better explain what it, what it is and why we should be interested in it despite the name I mean, it's my it's, it's my job title, basically. It was the title of my PhD was The Epoch of Reionization. Awful. And if you give a talk with that as the title, nobody turns up. Whereas if you call it the era of the first stars, <laughs> everyone turns up. All it is, is, um, it is it is the same as the era of the first stars. What it is, is just the way we measure it. So when you have all of this hydrogen all around the universe, and then you have pockets of that forming the first stars. So you have, you know, collapsing gas clouds of, of forming the first stars. When these first stars started throwing out all the all the light and the heat, they basically they did what's called ionize the surrounding clouds of hydrogen. You can think of it as burning a bubble in it. And so what happened was you get bubbles around each first stars where hydrogen just just is 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 burnt away so the the electron from the proton forcibly split up you don't have the hydrogen anymore that's what we observe so what we do is we look back we look at the radiation from the ionized hydrogen which is called why it's called ionization it's just a horrible name i hate it so much and what we see is some swiss cheese so if you imagine some leodama or whatever you're looking at cheese with holes in that's what we can see when we image this, these radio waves. And by looking over a billion years of Swiss cheese, we can see these bubbles forming and growing and merging and collapsing again. The shape of these bubbles can tell us how many black holes were there, how many first stars were there, because black holes make wispier bubbles. First stars make nice, neat little circular bubbles. It's, yeah, it's, it's just incredible that we can do so much with so little. Now, I, I, as you've probably noticed, you, you're a woman scientist, and that means, of course, as well as being asked about your work, you have to be asked about what it's like to be a woman scientist. Well, let, let me change that slightly, because it, I don't almost think it's never really very fair on, on women scientists. But one of the women you mention in your book is Cecilia Payne-Gaposchkin. Now, why, why, why haven't we heard of her, and why should we have heard of her? I mean, let's face it, it's only a few years since people have really heard of Rosalind Franklin, but, but why was Cecilia so important? So Cecilia Payne-Kaposchkin in the 1920s, I mean, she was a badass just in general, to be honest, because she just took no rubbish. At Cambridge, she was told that she, she couldn't do physics in the lab because the corsets would interfere with the electromagnetic equipment, which you know, has some truth in it also uh, was just used as an excuse so she did her phd in harvard eventually because nobody would give her a job in um the uk in england uh, because she was a woman so she went to harvard and she studied the sun and she studied the light from the sun and she studied how that light changes according to what elements are in the sun's atmosphere and what she found was actually that the sun appeared to be made mostly of hydrogen. And this was very strange in the 1920s because people thought that stars were just hot Earths. So again, very Earth centric. Those bright, pretty things are just just Earths on fire. And that's because you could see carbon and well, lots of oxygen. You could see evidence of that in the sun's light. So they're like, oh, well, all, all the same stuff in there, probably the same. 
Pain Gaboshkin, she just went in there and she said, no, absolutely no, it's all hydrogen. Everyone basically said she was wrong. Everyone said you've got it wrong. <laughs> so she went on to do other things. And of course, I'm, and I am going to have to throw it in there because I'm bitter for her. Two years later, her supervisor published the work without her name on. And now, of course, we know that the sun is, is, is made of Who'd have thought you know it? No, don't buy my book. Buy her yeah. memoirs, which... Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. I'm going to do it because I'm a big reader and I don't care. Cecilia payne memoirs, utterly amazing, life-changing. And what stars are made of? <laughs> so, the books that I would recommend when you buy my book. Well, we've, we've hand over now. Th th thank goodness. Th th thanks to you. It, it, it also, another thing that, that comes out of your book is that you, you argue it very much for People think of scientists as living off in, in some other other realm, but you argue for the importance of humanity in science. For for because guess what, scientists are people too, and and sometimes science doesn't want to admit of the possibility that it's wrong, or so if not science, some scientists. No, absolutely. So people really hide behind the idea that science is purely logical and free of emotion now equations <laughs> if you no, i disagree i'm just going to say it. i disagree because science is written and recorded and thought about by scientists who are humans like you've said and so you have their bias within their science you have people that have done have have discovered something and worked on it for 50 years somebody like cecilia payne kaboshkin rocks up and tells you you're completely wrong actually people don't take that well people get stuck in their ways and that's fine but we have to recognize that and this is why why you have to recognize that you you can have biases of the time in there you can you can you can have you can have scientific understanding held back because of racism because of sexism and that's why it's important for me to actually to recognise that and think of the scientists and what they were dealing with at the time. And yeah, I re it just really annoys me. It's because I also work in gender equality in academia and oh, the times I get asked, but shouldn't we just consider the scientist as a separate, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, no, no, <laughs> because you are assuming that that their their logic was 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 correct and why should it have been at the time it's yeah, it, no a, another word for for humanity it might be humility it's it's a question of scientists being or some scientists being humble enough to admit of the possibility that they might be wrong and that you can't anytime there's a new discovery you can't simply um, try to shoehorn it into into the the, the form of your previous theory and, and you know what? This has changed over time. It's really clear when you do a historical deep dive into the reading is that when you start getting scientific papers, you know, even from Newton's time, Newton's not a good example, actually, because he was a bit of a fool. But yeah, everyone else is like, we've had this idea. Has anybody else had this idea? Have you seen this? And everyone's writing to each other. And, you know, da, 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 da. then you kind of get into somewhere in the 1980s, quite recently. And I think it really is because science became global and not carried out by rich individuals, but by people like me that have to apply to a research council to get funding. That's great. But it also means that it's a competition. It means that we have to really say, my science is the best. To do that, you have to kind of gloss over the bits where you've been wrong and gloss over the bits where it might be a bit risky. And so you get scientific papers now which just exaggerate and exaggerate and exaggerate and don't ask for help. And that slows science down. And that's actually why I really liked the recent the more recent paper about this first discovery of the birth certificate of the of the first stars it's a very complex experiment you read this paper and actually what this paper is saying is oh my gosh we've done all of this stuff we've got some really weird results everyone can people just check this <laughs> you know that's that's how it should be done because now we've got about 10 experiments around the world trying to repeat that experiment 
There, there is a, a, a good story in, in, in your book. Well, there's lots of good stories in your book, but the, the one about um, the discovery of the element coronium, which is fascinating. They, 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 it's about, what, a shade under 100 years ago, scientists looked at the corona of the sun and using the best techniques they had and using the best knowledge that they had, the best theories that they had, they came up with the existence of a new element in the corona of the sun, which they called coronium, which wasn't there. Do you think that we have our coroniums in, in this age and there's a danger that not enough scientists will admit of the possibility that we don't know, it's not that we just don't know everything yet, that we don't actually know that some of the stuff we do think we know is wrong? I think, um... Yeah, I think it's generational. I think as humans, we get stuck in our ways. As humans, we justify the things we've done by saying that was the best way to do it. You know, confirmation bias. It has to have been the best way to, to have done it because I did it. And everything turned out fine. And this is why it's, it's really important to, to bring people into science, knowing that they should question everything. And this is what I tell young children. I, I gave a talk two days ago and I was talking to young children. Um, and, and you tell them, question everything. There are no stupid questions. So that you can go in and you can say, well, hang on a minute. That new element you're talking about, does that really make sense? And when you start to question it, yes, you get more questions. But that's the fun of it. And you find out more, 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 more. And yeah, that other thing might be wrong. And yeah, science, uh, people seem to think that science is this unattainable knowledge sometimes, that it's only done by people in ivory towers that, that understand it all. And it's like, no, that's not true at all. It's, it's pursued by people that want to understand it. But you ask somebody, anybody, if they understand the Big Bang, and they're lying. You can have somebody with eight Nobel Prizes, they will not understand the Big Bang, I promise you. They say words. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That, that's what I didn't ask you about, because I knew that would be an unfair question. Yes, what did happen then? Yeah, but th thank you very much. You should give yet another barefaced plug for your book. It's called First Light, Switching on Stars at the Dawn of Time by Dr. Emma Chapman. Uh, Emma, it, it's been really fascinating. An hour has sped past like that. Um, like like the life of a of, of a population three star, um, mm. I'd, I'd I'd like to invite our audience to, to, to thank you in, in such ways as they can, which presumably is, is not applause, but certainly in, in, in text form at least, um, for for a fascinating hour. And uh, I, I I wish you all the best with uh, with um, SKA. I still want to call it SKA. Dr. Emma Chapman, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.